We are under tremendous pressure to turn against one another in opposition, rather than turning towards one another in unity. And it's tearing us apart. If you were to tell me that pursuing unity is a waste of time, I'd say that my commitment is rooted in my faith tradition that commands me to love even my enemies. I would also remind you that it is a foundational ideal of the United States of America, that we, the people, have an ongoing calling to build a more perfect union. Have you ever thought about the fact that the very first goal of the Constitution is for unity, a, a binding loyalty among a group of people pursuing a future together? Can we agree that we're falling far short of more perfect these days? Can we also agree that those relationships that contribute to unity, those enduring connections that bind us in loyalty to one another individually, in groups, and socially, are under serious distress? Call it civil unrest or reckoning, cancel culture or an epidemic of unfriending, there is an undeniable clash occurring in our society today that some even call a cold civil war. It is with these and other forces at play that each of us face a fork in our road forward. The path most commonly chosen is towards disunity, to retreat into smaller, more uniform groupings, walking farther and farther away from people who are different than us or who we disagree with. The other option is to take the steps necessary to nurture unity to recognize we don't have to be uniform to be unified, to compassionately invite others who seem opposed to us to make a case for what they believe to be in our shared interests and for us to do the same, to stay in the heat, the discomfort of disagreement long enough to forge a mutually beneficial future. The good news is I have seen these very steps pay dividends in the work that I do helping companies and communities advance diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, in real and practical ways. And it turns out the way forward is the same regardless of the type of relationship. Whether we're talking about friends or family, companies or community-based organizations, even our country as a whole. The, the name on the road sign that points to unity is equity. So what do I mean by that? I have found the clearest, most useful way to describe equity is to think about it the same way it is used in spaces not necessarily about DEI, or even relationships. In short, equity is shared ownership. Whether we're talking about the percentage of a mortgage when buying a house, or the number of shares when buying a stock, 
the word that we use to describe shared ownership is equity. And if you would like to successfully pursue unity, you can do so by focusing on equity in two overlapping areas. The first is in our individual relationships at home and on teams. And the second is socially, the way groups of people build a future together. Let's focus first on individual relationships. And let's do that by recreating an experience I had uh, early in my days navigating DEI. Imagine me waiting by the phone, feeling sick to my stomach. Because despite my best intentions, at a meeting with a client, I, I caused real pain and frustration due to my ignorance and, frankly, insensitivity to issues related to indigenous people. It was so bad that by the time the meeting ended, I was pretty sure I had lost the contract. But more importantly, I was very concerned that I had lost people that I considered to be friends. Eventually, the phone rang. And it was this client following up on their commitment to equitable practices. They were inviting me to a meeting where we could pursue healing and unity in our relationships among the people on that team. Join me at the table during that follow-up meeting. Look around and, and listen to the way that each person describes how trust had been broken about how what I had done reinforced previous hurtful experiences that I never could have known about, about how making things right would require me to see the world through their point of view. Really see their tears. Hear the anger. Feel their pain. Now, I'll ask that you recall a time when you have been hurt or overlooked or misunderstood by a family member, a coworker, a colleague. Would you be able to sit at a table like that and communicate what you need? Would you be willing to be vulnerable enough to tell someone exactly what they have done to hurt you? knowing you're handing them a blueprint for how to do it again. And if the tables were turned, would you be willing to sit at a table and hear people describe to you the way that they believe you have hurt them? When I did that very thing at that table, it was one of the most humbling experiences of my entire life. However, it's where I came face to face with the power of equity, the power of taking time to build boundaries to protect our relationships, the power of putting real issues on the table to be examined, understood, and resolved through collaboration, no matter how high the heat. And the payoff made it all worth it. Once we found ourselves to a workable resolution, we realized that we were on a stronger, more loyal team. We had stepped in to a more beloved unity with one another, with a deeper commitment to one another as people and to our shared goals. This is how equity can unite us individually. Now let's take a moment and turn our focus. Let's think more broadly about how equity can lead to unity at a broader scale, socially, the way groups of people 
can build a shared future in our country together. We'll start by visiting an image that's pretty common in DEI circles. I'll ask, though, that you put yourself in the shoes of the people in one of these images in order to get a deeper and better understanding of shared ownership as the foundation for equity. How would you feel if you were standing there and someone else just comes along and moves those boxes without asking you what you wanted? I mean, it may be reasonable for that person to assume that all of you want to see over the fence. However, maybe one of you really wanted to be inside the stadium. Or maybe you lost your ball over the fence and you want it back so that you and your friends could play rather than watch a baseball game. Making sure we think about shared ownership ensures that we have meaningful collaboration among the people who are affected. Envisioning different racial groups on those boxes gives us a way to consider racial equity. It's not about taking boxes away from some people and then giving them to people of color, quote unquote, who are in need. It is about building a definition of success that is shared across all races. And then working together to overcome barriers to that success. Unfortunately, many of us have been conditioned to think about equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion, as dividing up limited resources. Thinking about equity through the lens of shared ownership helps us rethink that concern. Because another real-world example of people using shared ownership to build shared futures is the stock market, also known as equity markets. If, if you and I wanted to build a company together, we could take our idea to Wall Street and invite more people to join us. When they did, we wouldn't be cutting up pieces of an ever smaller pie. We'd be embracing more and more people, their resources and their ideas to build a shared future together. Applying this concept to social issues will require us to set tables much like the one we envisioned earlier. We will need to step in to the heat of disagreement with one another in ways we would probably much rather avoid. We cannot avoid it, though. Here is an example of how this shows up in my life and work. And I should tell you, it might even be difficult for you to hear. If I want a white supremacist to hear what I need, I have to love them enough to hear what they need so we can work together to build a future that works for both of us. As painful as that sounds individually, it is equally true socially. If any group of us, black people, other people of color, white people, even white supremacists, if they want to be heard, it starts with loving the others enough to be willing to listen. We are not going to eliminate one another from our country's future. So we must step in to a more beloved, more perfect unity with one another. This is what the US Constitution urges you and I to do with our fellow Americans, to bring more and more of them to 
the table. Despite the failings of our history, liberty and justice are not meant to be dished out in uneven pieces to a select few. Whether you can trace your roots to huddled masses yearning to breathe free, or peoples enslaved for the prosperity of others, whether you can follow your family tree back to Plymouth Rock, or to the sovereign nations that were here long before, we, all of us, in all of our differences, have to find ourselves to a table of the people, for the people, by the people, unless and in order to avoid the reality of our current disunity, destroying the ideal of America that lives in our hearts. People, this moment is calling to us. And if we think that these big issues are, are too big for us individually, we must never forget that more perfect national unity begins with more perfect personal unity. Each day, you face a fork in the road. One direction seems to be easier because it seems to be leading us away from direct conflict. However, it's also leading us away from one another and the commitments and the relationships that we have. The other, braver path leads us to a table where we, the people, can pursue unity through equity together. Which will you choose? Thank you.